Good afternoon. I'm David Levy. I'm the Dean of the Duke Law School. Welcome to the Robert R. Wilson Lecture. Professor Wilson was a professor of political science here at Duke University from 1925 to 1975. That's 50 years. The lectureship was established by Herman Walker, who was Wilson's student and then later became his colleague and also had a distinguished career in the academy and also outside of the academy. And you might say that this lecture, if we choose to view it in this way, symbolizes the strong bonds of affection and admiration that can grow up between two scholars, two scholars at Duke University. At the law school, the Wilson Lecture has been given each year by the John Hope Franklin Visiting Professor in American Legal History. And how fitting and proper that this year's Wilson's Lecture is given by Professor Lavolia Glimpf, also of Duke University, and also tied by bonds of affection and admiration with John Hope Franklin. This is the centennial year of John Hope Franklin's birth, and he was a huge figure in American history, uh, in African American history, and more generally. Professor Glimpf uh, has had most of her history career here at Duke University. This year at the law school, she's teaching a course on slaves as refugees and the law of war. Uh, she wrote an extremely interesting book called Out of the uh, House of Bondage in 2008, and she now has two book projects uh, that are forthcoming, one on women at war and one on uh, playing Dixie in Egypt, playing Dixie in Egypt, and that's about the soldiers of the Civil War, some of them, who went on to fight um, in Egypt after the war. John O. Franklin used to say that his life as a historian would not have been complete without the eight years that he spent at Duke Law School. I don't know if after a semester you can say the same thing, Professor Glimpf, but my hope is that this visit will be the beginning of a, of a long period of time where you will be most welcome here. Thank you for being here today. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I know every hour is precious to you law students, so I'm um, particularly pleased to see you and to see my own students here. And Dean Levi, thank you so much for this opportunity to first hold the chair, um, not chair, but the visiting professorship, um, and for introducing me to what has been a remarkable experience. Um, all of the faculty members at the law school who have um, taken me out for a drink or coffee or a meal, all of you who have welcomed me warmly in the hallways, I really have um, appreciated that. I am honored to give the lecture today, and I'd also like to um, thank my students um, who I see here in the audience um, who've made teaching in the law school a really rewarding experience, who've brought new insights to my work, and who have taught me the importance of the term dispositive. <laughs> it comes up frequently. They are doing wonderful projects, research projects, that will add immensely to our understanding of war, law, and refugees. So <clears throat> this morning, I lost the first page of my lecture. That's OK. I'll start somewhere else. In the late spring and the early summer of 1864, Missouri Lewis, Melinda Johnson, Mary Miller, Martha Ann Mark, and Ann Hayes 
aborted the babies they were carrying. We know that Missouri, Lewis, and Ann Hayes did not survive the operation. When I first came across these women, I wondered about the circumstances that had brought them to this point. Were they first-time mothers? Were they soldiers' wives? Had they made the journey from slavery to Union lines alone? Or did they come in the company of kin or friends? Did they have anyone to turn to when they found out they were pregnant? Anyone in whom to confide or to turn to for advice? Did other women assist them? But the question that stood out most to me was why now? Why now when they were free and presumably had much to live for? Their actions certainly did not square with the scholarship over the past two decades. The scholarship has chron chronicled in rich detail the struggle of black people to lay claim to their children, the struggle of parents who fought to take their children with them into freedom, making what was a dangerous trek. The struggle of freed people after the war as they search for parents and siblings and other relatives long into the 20th century. I come to this study from long engagement with the history of slavery and war. That work has increasingly been concerned with the law of war and freedom. I am interested in the intersection of property claims and human beings and the operation of human rights and the law. In part, I am tracking a history of refugees and human rights antecedent to the 20th century and UN protocols and treaties of the post-World War II era. The problems that I am looking at raise important questions of statelessness and displacement and the right to asylum and surveillance sprinkled by relief efforts. The race and the statelessness of black refugees has made it easy and made it easy at the time to see them mostly as a danger to the state, as a source of political contamination and disease, ways that made it really hard to see them as legible subjects struggling for freedom and citizenship. The subjects of my work, black women and children, were especially vulnerable. And so I, I have this in my mind as I gradually come to understand why the question I have asked about the women who had abortions was absolutely the wrong question. Despite being steeped in the knowledge that emancipation was a protracted affair, the question why now assumed a linear path to freedom assumed a kind of inevitability. It assumed in some that a resort to abortion in the face of the arrival of freedom made no sense at all. Not now when enslaved women could finally look forward to enjoying freedom, when they could finally look forward to enjoying motherhood unhampered by laws that made their bodies the property of slaveholders and to the birth of every child they bore. Perhaps these women simply believed they were too young to bring a child into the world. Perhaps they were ill or alone without kin. Perhaps they wondered how they could nurture a child, a baby, on weakened breast milk or one half of a ration. But what we know is that before their own eyes, they saw what one observer called fearful mortality in the camps where they lived. They saw before their own eyes the escalation in the number of women suffering from all kinds of diseases, from uterine prolapse to miscarriages. They saw before their own eyes an increase in orphaned babies and children amidst a growing population of mothers who succumbed to disease, their newborn children dying alongside them like the pregnant woman of two children who died right after she got to camp. Most importantly then, the question why now did not take into consideration that these women were refugees. They were refugees in a camp and they were largely invisible to the law of war and to the claims of humanity. It was late in 1864 when they had these abortions it was more than a year after the Emancipation Proclamation. 
Their names appear in the archival record on a list of more than a thousand people who sought health care. They, with these others, were suffering from all kinds of diseases, pneumonia, smallpox, malaria, chronic diarrhea, syphilis, typhoid fever, epilepsy, dropsy, debility, worms, scurvy, and the list goes on. This list tells us a lot about the conditions of refugee camps in the Civil War, and it tells us a lot about the disparate impact on black women and children who represented the majority population in these camps. The work of scholars over the last half century has detailed as never before this problem of emancipation, its unevenness, its precariousness, and as I said, its protracted nature. It has told us or talked to us about the ways in which emancipation was beholden to military strategies and outcomes and to the struggle of black people to move emancipation uh, to place it on the Union agenda. The Union War was one we know at huge cost, a huge cost in lives, some 650 to 750,000 uh, casualties from the ranks of soldiers. We also know now more about the price paid by the enslaved. For many slaves, one scholar writes, or he wrote more than a quarter of a century ago, quote, their baptism into freedom took place amid all the suffering, misery, dislocation, and confusion, which have commonly been the fate of the refugees, the homeless, and other defenseless victims of warfare throughout history. These um, refugees were many like the father who appears in an 1863 document and who said, our children are dying fast in the camps as we carry them from place to place and bury them in the cold ground. The refugees that I am working, are trying to study, are in many ways similar to the refugees that we've become so familiar with today in Syria, who are coming out of Syria and other places. Over the course of the Civil War, hundreds of thousands of enslaved people left the plantations and farms. They fled hoping to get to the safety of Union lines or Union-occupied territory. From the very start of their journeys, they faced the perennial problems of refugees everywhere. Would they receive sanctuary? How would they care for themselves and keep their families together? But they, unlike most refugees today, entered the world of displaced persons as enslaved people. The refugee camps into which these people poured or were placed are indeed comparable in many respects to refugee camps that have arisen in the context of other wars. Like modern day refugee camps, they arose in the context of a humanitarian crisis, a context that remains largely invisible in the work of historians, and also in the work of legal scholars. Despite the mountain of contemporary documentation, our civil war is not seen as a site of a humanitarian crisis. A rich body of scholarship on the problem of refugees in the 20th and 21st centuries and questions of genocide and campaigns of terror can help us reimagine and tell the story of the longer genealogy of refugees and refugee camps and their management. It is clear that many Americans at the time understood perfectly what was taking place was a humanitarian crisis and one of massive proportions. From Union commanders and agents of the Treasury Department to agents of Northern missionary organizations and Freedmen's Societies came reports couched in the language of human rights violations. <clears throat> 
The situation one Union commander pleaded was one of urgent humanity. Pennsylvania Congressman William Kelly titled a lecture he gave to an audience of black people in Philadelphia, The War and Rights of Humanity. Wartime reports of human rights violations flooded northern media and were sprinkled throughout the reports of military commanders, the letters of ordinary soldiers on both sides. Confederate Commander General J.G. Walker reported his capture of 2,000 women and children in 1863, and he wrote with pride, I have restored them to their masters. Writing to the medical director in the Western Department in 1863, a superintendent of refugees said this, quote, I am utterly astonished at the charge I find in hand here. The multitude under my charge are women and children with lame, old, with men old, lame, and helpless. An inspection of half the tents under his care, which equaled about a fourth of his charges, of the people under his charge, quote, found three babies, not older than 10 months dead. He concluded that the condition of things is disheartening and frightful. The report of a Union commander of a raid on a refugee camp was another document of this kind. The commander described what he called, quote, scenes of a character never witnessed before in a civilized country. The raiders, he said, had spared neither age, sex, nor condition. They had shut some of the women and children up in their quarters and literally roasted them alive. The charred remains found in numerous instances testify to the degree of atrocity that he said, quote, has no parallel in either civilized or savage warfare. Young children, he concluded, only five or six were found skulking in the cane break, wounded. Helpless women were shot down in the most inhumane manner. In a letter to President Lincoln, a delegation from the Western Sanitary Commission also noted the worsening conditions and called loudly upon the humane and loyal people of the northern states for help. The refugees, they said, had no housing. Most were almost naked, with disease and death prevailing to a fearful extent. No language, the letter said, quote, can describe the suffering the destitution and neglect which, preve which prevails in some of these camps. The sick and dying are left uncared for and the dead unburied. It would seem that one half are doomed to die in the process of freeing the rest, end quote. Little changed. Into the following year, refugees continue to gather outside Union lines. Reports of hundreds of people driven up to Union lines by guerrilla forces, reports of too little shelter, of frightened people, of smallpox and other diseases fueled by a lack of clean water, sufficient food, and poor sanitary conditions. White civilians also added their voices to the documentary evidence. I have written elsewhere, for example, of the joy with which South Carolina slaveholders celebrated the execution of Rose. Um, advance? Okay. So these are just some of the images of slaves on the. That one's not. Right, person left. Is there another way to advance manual? Yeah. I've written elsewhere um, of Rose, as I said, um, who was executed. Um, she was an enslaved woman by Confederate scouts. Thank you. Um, and um, you know, here we see, this is Rose, 
um, who was sold right before she decided um, the war started and she decided to lead a rebellion, where here she's listed for $200. Refugee and government camps, <clears throat> labor camps, proved especially easy targets for regular Confederate forces, guerrilla forces, and scouts, and wartime patrols set up by local governments to keep, quote, the Negroes in order, end quote. Irregular and detached bands were a particular problem. Commanders of these forces sometimes held commissions from the Confederate War Department. Sometimes they acted under special local authority. And because they were detached, they could operate as guerrilla forces and were a real danger to the refugees in the camps. They not only killed them, but those left standing, they dragged back into slavery. The evidence of human rights violations also surfaced in the letters and post-war testimonies of black people. One refugee, one refugee, Louisa Smith, recalled being with other women in a camp. And they were working the land, she said, when the rebels came and captured many of them and took them away. She was among the fortunate who scattered, who got away, who fled in terror to the banks of the river, where, quote, mothers crouched at the water's edge in evident dread lest their pursuers should find them clinging to their children. Finding a small boat, some of the women moved themselves two to three at a time to a sandbar in the Mississippi River, and they put up a makeshift shelter. Union gunboats began passing them by, and they beckoned despairingly to be taken on board, according to a man who was on the Union gunboat. But he wrote, we passed on. What became of these Negroes, I do not know. He might not have learned what happened to this particular group. But what he saw as he continued to uh, uh, witness and write as he passed up the Mississippi River surely gave him some idea. In the recently liberated city of Vicksburg, he saw a woman dying, lying behind a fence, dying alone, without the company of kin or community. Citing an outbreak of disease, the army ordered the removal of refugees from the city, the well, the sick, and the dead. He watched as the army sent 20 wagons to handle the job, one wagon dedicated solely to hauling the dead. In one house, they found six dead people, but uh, small children, uh, children sitting and lying around them. The job of searching out, removing, and burying the dead on the banks of the Mississippi River took over two weeks. 3,000 refugees, some infected with smallpox, were eventually removed to the other side of the river where they were left in the weeds with no shelter. They died at a rate of 15 to 20 per day. Some of these survivors, the same observer wrote, crawled into the woods to die, where their bodies could be found only by the stench which arose from the, the decay. Thousands of displaced women and children remained without shelter of any kind. Observers noted them roving about with no support or protection. And even in Union garrisoned towns like Vicksburg, they were dying on the streets. At Memphis, they were returning from the plantations where they had been driven by guerrilla forces. And also at a moment's notice, black women and children could find themselves evicted from union lines. That would not change uh, through the end of the war. Confederate attacks on refugee camps meant that they were often no safer than on the open roadways. The Army Appropriations Bill of 1863 provided meager funding to help the budget for medicine and medical attendance for Negro refugees was $50,000 in 
out of a total budget bill of seven hundred and twenty nine uh, mil, uh, million this is a billion eight hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Civil War refugee camps were increasingly filled with women like Nancy Lee, who gave birth in a refugee camp. Women with no nearby male kin, women with children, women with health problems. They were filled with children. In the camp where Nancy Lee lived, or was a refugee, women made up 44% of the camp population, children 42%. Thus, women and children alone in this camp made up 86% of the total population. But these are nothing but the gross, uh, gross statistics. Behind them lie intimate stories of life and death and survival and government regulation. In the world in which Nancy Lee's child was born, there were 56 orphans out of 227 children. And what's really interesting is that the vast majority of these orphans, some 71%, lived alone. That is, with no adult present. At least one third of the residents in the camp where she was were elderly. Most of these were women, 42%. There were also people in the camp that the superintendent called quote, inefficient, people who were disabled, 29 people described as cripples, the majority women. Nearly three quarters of these disabled people lived alone, and some lived with children. And you can, you know, you read and read, and, and the story doesn't change. Um, reports from April 63 of 200, I mean, 2,999 women and children at one camp and less than 600 men at that camp. At another camp, 1,300 women and children. At another camp, 1,200 women and children. And a total in that particular region of 22,000 refugees in eight camps. Ration reports also uh, give us a sense of the gender imbalance. Women were the recipients of most of the rations. So this is the region that I'm mainly studying, uh, the Mississippi Valley. And of course, as I, I pointed out, most women who come into these camps are not like this woman who this is, uh, had the time to, to get a photo taken with her husband and children. Um, So this is a, an example of the kind of data I'm using to, uh, to, uh, for the study. Um, and here, the headings are missing, but here you can see the names of the refugees. And this number uh, list, uh, gives you like how many adults in the household um, uh, and how many children. So here you have five children, seven, six children. And this number is the number of rations. And so five children, you get three and a half rations, and so on and so forth. And this column um, gives us information on their uh, condition. So what I'm trying to do in part, and you can see here, you know, orphan, you know, somebody who has no legs, six, six, six. What I'm trying to do, what I feel a real strong uh, need to do is to first establish um, that what we have here is a refugee problem, and then we can get to the, um, the legal ramifications. Despite the growing availability of, of information on these camps, Despite the widening legal embrace of fugitive slaves, refugees remained at the margins of northern consciousness, and their safety continued to, to depend heavily on the dispositions and whims of local commanders. When placed up against more recent episodes of violence against unarmed persons, the Civil War in this country looks eerily familiar 
A major difference, of course, is that at that time there were no international protocols in place that might have offered some means of redress. Black refugees were a stateless people. At no point during the Civil War did any other country offer to take them in. Abolitionists in England might decry slavery, but they made no effort to offer sanctuary. The only nation to which black refugees could flee was the United States, but white northerners opposed their migration there. For two years, Lincoln would look to colonization to square the difficulty. And once the war was over, he thought he could use the US Navy to carry the rest of black people away. America's refugee camps, overwhelmingly populated by women and children, shared telling characteristics with modern-day refugee camps. Like modern-day refugees, these refugees fled in the full knowledge that failure to make it out of a war-torn area could easily result in death, and in their case, re-enslavement. And with the knowledge that no matter how they understood the meaning of the war, they lacked the formal protections of the state that accrued to citizens. After 1863, their plight becomes increasingly inexplicable and indefensible. Under the pressure of these refugees, what can be called a law of war for slavery gradually develops. And so these are just images of refugees, and I want to... You know, and then this is just going to quickly go through this. Um, so the war starts with Congress uh, passing a resolution or an amendment to the Constitution that would have um, done what had not been done up to this point, which would have um, constitutionally sanctioned the institution of slavery, right? Um, and over the first two years of the war, the refugees pressed and pressed, and Congress had to respond. They responded with the first Confiscation Act of 1861, the Article of War of 1862, and the second Confiscation Act of 1862, and the Militia Act of 1862. And just to briefly summarize, uh, what these measures did was to first um, uh, offer some kind of, um, of, of legal um, place, um, if you will, for these refugees. Um, refugees could no longer, as a result of these measures, be turned back. They could no longer be um, uh, given over to masters who came in to claim them. Um, and men under the Militia Act of 1862, enslaved men could now uh, join the Union forces as military laborers. And uh, what's really in, uh, significant about the Militia Act of 1862 as well is that it also said that the wives and children of these men would be offered protection as long as they were slaves of disloyal men. So if you were a woman trying to get from... Um, uh, Maryland to freedom in Pennsylvania, you were not uh, to be allowed to do that and claim freedom. If you were a slave trying to get from Virginia to Pennsylvania, that was a different story. And also famously, as most of you um, in the law school, or many of you who study human rights and, 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 and uh, military codes and so forth, uh, know very important to this whole business was uh, Lieber's Code, uh, which was promulgated in 1863. At the behest of... Um, the Secretary of War and um, Lincoln. This was to be a code of conduct for the operations of the military forces. But Lieber wrote that these refugees, the fugitive slaves, fell under, quote, the shield of the law of nations. He wrote, quote, that fugitives escaping from a country in which they were slaves, villains, or serfs into another country 
had been always in the past centuries held free and acknowledged free by judicial decisions of European countries, even when the local or municipal law uh, disagreed. Therefore, he wrote in a war between the United States and a belligerent which admits of slavery, like the South. If a person held in bondage by that belligerent be captured or come in as a fugitive, they come in under the, the protection of the military forces of the United States, and such person is immediately entitled to the rights and privileges of a free man. And to return such a person to slavery amounted to enslaving a free person. Thus long, before, thus, long before the 1954 UN Convention relating to the status of refugees articulated a prohibition against expulsion or the return of refugees or reforma to territories, the Libra Code seemed to be on the record against return, against expulsion, a principle laid out in 1954 in particular. On the grounds, however, the administration of the principle took a back seat to ideas grounded in over 250 years of slavery, resulting in human rights violations. It was commonly understood that these refugees were fugitives from the fear of return, as General Butler said in 1861. On the one hand, there was an understanding of the difficulties they faced. One surgeon wrote of their destitution, the exposure and beatings from the sun and pelting storms and so forth. And he added optimistically that because the Union had come, these people would, quote, no longer be permitted to die in the streets, a drag out a miserable life of filth and festering disease in wretched dog kennels where the eye of humanity never penetrates. But while poorly sheltered in condemned camps, leaky and without floors or in crowded, filthy tenements, the refugees came to be blamed for the conditions in which they lived, which is also a familiar story. The Union never embraced slaves as insurrectionists nor as legitimate candidates for refugee status. Their flight, wrote Edmund Ruffin, an avid secessionist who found a way to join the cadets from uh, VMI in order that he could attend the execution of John Brown and made his way in 1861 to South Carolina to be there when the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter. Ruffin would choose suicide in the summer of 1865 rather than live in a nation where he could no longer own human beings. The legal post General Butler adopted in 1861 designating refugees or runaway slaves as contraband of war gave him men to work, to put to work, but this notion of contraband of war did not encompass black people's vision of freedom and refugee status. That became clear when three days later, after he had let the first group in, when more men appeared, and this time they brought their wives and children. And he said, I can't, Butler said, I, I don't know what to do with this. I cannot use women, maybe a few, but I cannot use children. And also he wrote that as a political question and as a question of humanity, you know, he was having a hard time thinking about sending them back. Not taking the children, he said, of the humanitarian aspect of this, I have no doubt. Of the political one, I have no right to judge. These People had become refugees, and long before the end of the Civil War, they had come, as one refugee noted, to fear the camps. But to the question, what are we going to do with women and children? When that question went from the, the battlefields up to Washington, the answer that most often came back from <clears throat> Washington from the adjutant general's office was, quote, the law prohibits the return of slaves. It does not provide for their reception or support at military camps. <clears throat> 
Increasingly, black women and children fled alone. Increasingly, they faced freedom in the company of women. In a 1927 report to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, Eileen Pittaway, currently the director at the, of the Center for Refugee Research at the University of New South Wales, made this observation, quote, in 30 years in the field, she wrote, I have never before been in an, an established camp where the fear was so palpable and pervasive and where malnutrition and poverty was so rife. Corruption, rape, sexual abuse, abductions, trafficking, organized prostitution, ration fraud, and a systemized regime, regime of terror along with malnutrition and untreated medical condition, conditions, had left 26,000 refugees in a state of trauma. Pittaway's description of life and death in a 21st century refugee camp in Bangladesh is all too familiar to us today. It could easily stand in for other places and times in the more recent past where warfare, political revolutions, and upheavals have displaced and killed millions for Bosnia, Rwanda, Sudan, Syria, to name a few. Throughout history, warfare has generated displaced persons who flee proximity to battlefields and the accompanying violence. And I want to conclude here. I think I'm probably running out of time. Few people today, when they think of the U.S. Civil War, think of crimes against humanity. Few people today think of the U.S. Civil War when they think of refugee populations clinging to, sorted, to life in sordid camps in garrisoned towns, dying of malnutrition and disease and enemy fire are subjected to rape. The American Civil War is remembered for many things, but not for its refugee camps filled to overflowing with women and children. Enslaved people who became refugees during the Civil War may constitute what we today refer to as unrecognized refugees. As historian George Rabel points out, the term American refugees has a curious ring to it. The adjective and the noun seem oddly joined. Americans have long assumed, he writes, that becoming a refugee, like so many other historical tragedies, happens only to strange people in foreign lands. But like most historians, Rabel was speaking of white refugees. Thus, if the term American refugees has a curious ring, even more curious, it seems, is the phrase black refugees. In April of 1865, the U.S. Sanitary Commission The Sanitary Commission purchased 12 pairs of shoes for children, and it purchased syrup and shirts and starch and sugar and apples and port wine and blackberry cordial. These were refugee children who, following the battle at Washington, North Carolina, and its evacuation by Union forces in April of 1864, and the surrender of Plymouth, North Carolina. These were the children of the men of the first and second Union volunteers. They and their mothers fled to New Bern and Beaufort, and when they got there, they were quartered. They were quartered in hospital buildings. Some of them were put in the Baptist church, the Sanitary Commission detailed northern teachers to assist them. The city, citizens of Beaufort contributed $40 to their care. The patients at a Union Hospital gave another $50. And plans were put in place immediately to clear land on a bluff for health reasons and to put up housing for these women and children. 
no such effort would be made on behalf of black women and children of this sort. White Union refugees lived in a world apart. As another group of Northerners wrote, quote, for the Union refugees, it would seem that no other plea can be needed than the simple statement that they have been deprived of all their property, that they have been driven from their homes simply because they would not be rebels. These people had made sacrifices. It was sad. But black women and children also decided they would not be rebels. The history of refugees in the Civil War is a history of, one of what one of my students in the law uh, course has termed the co-option of legal reasoning of the law being used as a code of war. Thank you. Well, that was so interesting. Not very cheerful, but very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and you've agreed to take some questions, so if there are any. Yes. You mentioned the Sanitary Commission. I wonder about the uh, Bureau of Freedmen, uh, uh, contraband of property. Uh, it was another federal agency. I wonder what role that played in uh, dealing with the refugees. Uh, the, the Freedmen's Bureau would not have played any role in, at this particular moment because it's not established until after the war. Um, and so what we, we have, what we sometimes call a pre-bureau um, um, at this moment, but there's no Freedmen's Bureau until 1865. So they're not on the ground. But what's really interesting um, is that, you know, part of the story is that these women uh, who were refugees were um, also put to work and they were made to pay a tax. Um, part of their uh, wage was taken out up front and that wage was put into something called the Freedmen's Fund. Um, and what was left over at the end of the war was uh, sent over to the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands um, to support its Custis Mansion uh, existed almost in yeah. the 20th century. Yeah, the shanty towns continued. I mean, and you can still see you could still see them in the nation's capital, where there were many. I mean, Lincoln, when he would go to um, what's now called Lincoln's Cottage to ride or get a break from the White House, he had to uh, ride past these um, uh, refugee colonies and. Um, so they do continue to exist, but it's, a, you know, of course, a different story that has more to do with um, uh, what people don't get with freedom, you know, and the, the backlash that comes um, um, after the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments um, uh, that rolls back uh, the gains that were um, accomplished um, from 65 to about... Um, um, 78 or so. Thank you for the question. Professor, uh, very interesting. I'm, I'm wondering, has anybody looked at the mortality rates of those who did not become refugees, those who became refugees, as well as those in prisoner of war camps, both in North and in South? Because I think of Andersonville and with the horrific death rate that was there. And I'm wondering if anybody has taken a health science look at this and to try to distinguish between what was the result of, say, nefariousness versus what it was the result of the state of health science in the 1860s and what in dealing with people who are in very close quarters. In um, that's an excellent disease. question. And to my knowledge, no one has um, done this sort of big picture uh, portrait of what you're talking about, but we are seeing work being done that um, when it's all done, which I, you know, I mean, a lot of great stuff has already come out, will allow us to, to, to have this sort of composite portrait. Um, my own interest, um, um, uh, uh, research, um, 
in this area, it was funded by the NIH, was to just get at some sense of, of what this looks like in the camps. And I, you know, and so part of my concern was, okay, on the one hand, there's a lot of death and disease, but there's also death and disease during slavery on plantations. So how do you distinguish uh, what's a war-related um, incident, health incident, as, as opposed to uh, just one that results because people are in crowded conditions, because uh, people are having to walk roadways and cross rivers where dead animals are, you know, in the water, in the streets, that sort of thing. Um, it's a great and important question that we have to um, really turn to. Um, some economists have uh, begun um, doing some quite serious work at Chicago um, looking at these questions from the point of view of the mortality um, of soldiers. And, um, but we don't have anything respectable um, in terms of um, uh, slaves and freed people. What have you found besides the changes in the laws from this period that are different between those two as you look at them side by side? Oh, that's a really hard question. Um, it, I have, I spent a great deal of time just trying to uh, read the literature on um, refugee camps and also um, um, Included in that work, um, the literature, at least a great deal of literature on um, even concentration camps. Um, so I, all I can say with any kind of um, uh, reasonable certainty is that we see similarities in terms of the circumstances, the living conditions, but I don't want to make an argument um, that the forces that uh, uh, bring about these camp situations are similar. They're only, s the, the, the main similarity is that you have people who are fleeing um, generally uh, war or war-related circumstances, regardless of the source of that warfare, whether it's a political revolution, a civil war, whatever. Um, and you have also, you know, some of the students in my law class are doing some really interesting things with this. You have also um, questions concerning the administration of these camps then and now, and the students are finding some interesting parallels. Um, but I haven't myself done the research for that, but it's a great question. Thank you. Well, we didn't, didn't have a human rights clinic back then, but I'm wondering. I know, but the human rights <laughs> people here are, they are here. Yeah. Here they are. And I'm wondering whether there was any interaction with the the law or with, with lawyers um, during that? Was there anybody who were, was trying to mobilize the courts or, or use other legal processes to address any of the, prob the terrible problems that you identified? Um, yes, um, there were. I mean, there were people like um, uh, Salmon Chase who was uh, <clears throat> trying to mobilize um, uh, people's interest. And the problem was not that there was no interest um, in, you know, possibly bringing um, some of the stuff to a court, but there's no grounds, right? Because uh, these people are not citizens, and as Dred Scott case made clear, they um, have no rights to bring um, cases to courts, um, at least certain courts. So there is an interest, and, and you can see that in the correspondence of Chase, for example, but nothing um, happens. Thank you very much. That was so